Yeah. Okay. I see all but all but Jim. So uh, it is uh, four o'clock on uh, on uh, what is today? Monday, May May eighth, uh, two thousand twenty-three, and this is the first uh, meeting of the Budget Committee for the City of Manzanita. All members of the committee are present, with the exception of Jim Dopp, who has an excuse. And then we have other people uh, watching on Zoom and other in an additional crowd, uh, we hope, on uh, the broadcast. So the first step in the first budget committee meeting is to call uh, to to elect a chair and vice chair for the committee. These are not uh, positions that you hold by right, divine right of kings. So anyway, I would I would entertain nominations for chair and vice chair of the budget committee. Yes, Catherine. I would like to nominate Dave Dillon to continue on as budget committee chair for this next year. Mm -hmm. Any vice chairs? Linda. I'd like to nominate uh, Catherine Stock as vice chair for the committee. Okay. Okay, we have, do we have any other nominations for either position? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to uh, uh, elect me as the chair and Catherine as the vice chair. Do I have, do I have a motion, please? So moved. Okay, let's move on. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, seconded. All in, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And it is aye. unanimous. And, and I told Layla I can't find my orb and scepter right now, but uh, we'll proceed <laughs> with the meeting. And the first, the first order is to receive the budget message. So, Layla, <coughs> you're on. Okay, great. Um, let me just share my screen. I have a PowerPoint as usual, but you guys see that? Yes. So just before I jump into the budget message, um, I just thought I'd share the agenda for folks so we kind of know what we're covering today, what you're in for, and then um, where we're going to be, what we're going to cover tomorrow. So budget message is today. The main focus of today's presentation will be on the general fund. We'll start with revenue, and then I'm going to hand it over to the chief uh, to go over the public safety department budget and the public safety reserve budget. Then we'll pop back over to me. I'll go through the administration's budget, courts, parks, and non-department. And then I'm going to go into the City Hall Construction Fund um, because there's a lot of relationships between the two and the Tourism Promotion and Facilities Fund. Uh, tomorrow, we will focus on uh, the Building Fund. We'll start with that and the Building Reserve Fund. Then we will move to the Water Utility Fund, the Public Works Equipment Reserve Fund, the Water SDC Fund, the Storm Drain SDC Fund, the Parks SDC Fund, the Road Fund, and then we'll finish it off with the Timber, Timber Management Fund and the Housing Loan Rehab Fund. So uh, one of the first things that we do here is the budget message, and I am pleased to present the proposed budget for fiscal year 23-24. The purpose of the budget message is to provide an overview of the budget document itself, any changes to or proposed financial policies for the coming fiscal year, and any proposed changes to appropriations and revenue. This year's budget builds on a year of tremendous success directly attributed to our, the leadership of our city council and to the hard work of city staff who continue to take on the challenges set before them and who continue to go well beyond the call of duty. The fiscal year 23-24 budget proposal provides a pathway for staff to support the city council and the important decisions ahead of them and to provide the highest quality service to the community. In April of 2023, the City Council adopted Resolution 2303, establishing Council Goals for 2023. The City Council voted unanimously to continue three multi-year goals set forth by the previous City Council with the inclusion of a fourth goal related to Councilor communication with the community. The fiscal year 23-24 adopted Council Goals are to level up Manzanita, so to enhance administrative functions of the city, including the incorporation of modern technology and the construction of a new city hall, which are essential to the ensure 
continued efficient provision of city services. Goal two is to budget forward Manzanita and to implement diversified revenue streams to ensure the city's ongoing financial health. Goal three is envision Manzanita to review and update the comprehensive plan and its enabling ordinances. Goal four is council communication. The city council will create more opportunities for direct engagement with citizens to ensure that all voices in the community are heard on a regular basis and expand resources online for citizens to stay informed and engaged. The budget allocates resources to ensure that ongoing baseline city services and explains where and how council goals will be implemented. This budget is focused on results and delivering outcomes to ensure that the city's resources are used effectively and efficiently. As required by law, this budget is balanced based on projected revenues and expenditures. I'm going to go into the transient lodging tax. In terms of revenue, the proposed fiscal year 23-24 budget continues the tradition of budgeting conservatively by underestimating revenues and overestimating expenditures, but we rely on historical data and the recent financial trends, including inflation, to get those estimates a little closer to the mark. This provides a much more realistic picture of our financial position. To that end, the transient lodging tax, which is the city's largest source of revenue, is estimated based on pre-COVID trends. In the five years prior to COVID, the TLT increased on average 12% per year. The estimate for TLT this year is based on taking fiscal years 2017 and 2018 TLT revenue and increasing it by 10% to the current year to the smooth out the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, where TLT funds were both positively and negatively impacted. The shutdown of short-term rentals in 2020 impacted the city's revenue negatively, whereas subsequent years TLT revenue skyrocketed. Between 20 fiscal years 2020 and 2021 and fiscal years 21 and 22, the city saw a 42% increase in TLT. The fiscal year 23-24 budget estimates a $1.3 million for the fiscal year. I'm going to go into the budget uh, to the council goals. So leveling up Manzanita, financial policies and forecasting. In fiscal year 22-23, the city council implemented for the first time an official policy reserve for the general fund. Past practices by previous city councils and city managers have taken an informal approach to significantly underestimate revenue and to generously overestimate expenditures. The Government Financial Officers Association, GFOA, recommends that governments should establish a formal policy on the level of unrestricted fund balance in the general fund for generally accepted accounting principles to mitigate current and future risks, such as revenue shortfalls and unanticipated expenditures. To level up Manzanita last year, I proposed a formal general fund policy reserve that was ultimately adopted by City Council via Resolution 2213. Resolution 2213 requires a general fund policy reserve for the general fund, beginning with a 15% operating 15 of operating expenses and increasing 2.5% each year until the policy reserve reaches 25%. As such, this year's budget proposal includes a general policy fund, general fund policy reserve of 17.5%. In fiscal year 22-23, I also introduced the financial forecast into the budget. This model is not sophisticated nor replicable, but it was a starting point to illustrate important trends and to assess the opportunities and challenges to revenue streams and expenditures. As part of the council goal to level up Manzanita in fiscal year 22-23, I engaged an experienced government financial professional to develop a sophisticated, transparent forecast model that can serve the city on an ongoing basis for the general fund. The financial projections illustrate that the city's general fund is still in a strong financial position. The fiscal year 23-24 budget does not include a forecast for the water utility fund. Until the new water rates are set, any forecast of the water utility fund will not provide an accurate picture of the water utility's future. While the water utility continues to have a carryover balance each year, the city's decision not to raise rates for inflation is now catching up to us. Even with record inflation, the city's responsible management of the water utility has resulted in a modest carryover balance each year. 
The fiscal year, this fiscal year, the city council is considering a water rate increase to catch up with inflation and ensure the ongoing maintenance and operational requirements of the water utility. The options before council include limiting the quantity of water provided by the base rate and include a tiered rate system for water usage that exceeds the base rate. Staff will be recommending that the city council approve an annual increase in rates to account for inflation to ensure a healthy reserve adequate funding for required maintenance and ongoing operational needs. I am confident that if the rates can be adjusted to reflect 10 years of unaccounted inflation and the actual requirements to maintain and operate the water utility in the current financial context, by next fiscal year, the water utility will be in a much stronger position. The City Council can at that time consider a reasonable policy reserve for the water utility to ensure its ongoing financial health. The policy adjustments that were made last year have contributed positively to the city's financial stability. In November 2022, S&P Global issued a city's credit rating of AA minus stable. The report stated that the city's budgetary stability is supported by recent changes in management, such as the adoption of new policies and practices that include a conservative approach to short-term rental revenues a formal policy reserve, and a multi-year budget forecast. The City Council also adopted a materials and services indirect cost methodology by a resolution 2301 for determining indirect costs. The fiscal year 23-24 budget includes indirect cost transfers from the water utility and the building fund. The fiscal year 23-24 budget proposal includes resources to develop a replicable budget model for all funds that meet the GFOA standards and best practices to set the stage for obtaining a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. It is also includes resources for continuing to work with a government financial professional to assist the city in reviewing, revising, and implementing a set of fiscal financial policies that provide a central and long-term approach to the financial management of the city. My goal as city manager and as the city's budget officer is to ensure that the city has the tools and resources in place to ensure effective and transparent governance based on best practices. I also want to make sure that the procedures and methodologies employed by the city's administration is transferable. This means engaging with subject matter experts where appropriate and establishing tools that can be inherited by future city managers to ensure a seamless transition in leadership to the benefit of the city. Capital improvement planning. The fiscal year 23-24 budget includes the city's first capital improvement plan. The CIP provides guidance and planning for the city of Manzanita's infrastructure and is based on the city's master plan documents, including the water master plan and the stormwater master plan. It also includes the proposed city hall project. This initial CIP focuses primarily on water maintenance project for which there is funding available and staff capacity. Classic Street and Dorcas Phase Two, much of which are unfunded, were included with the expectation that these projects will only move forward if additional funding sources are identified. Staff will engage with the city council over the coming year to review the city's CIP and 10-year project list to identify additional priority projects in the CIP if and when council adopts new funding sources for infrastructure. Budgeting forward Manzanita. One of the key goals from last year's budget was to hire a consultant to review and analyze potential funding sources to help diversify the city's revenue stream. The city hired Echo Northwest through a competitive process to conduct this study. That study is now complete and the report is being finalized. The goal of the report was to provide the city with sustainable revenue options that have a nexus to current expenditure challenges. Manzanita's economy is built around tourism, which must be managed appropriately, and current revenue sources are not aligned with the needs and are insufficient to cover core city functions. Key findings also included that the resident population provides insufficient revenue to cover core infrastructure and other core costs. Typically, most revenue comes from user fees and property taxes to provide city services. In Manzanita, only 9% of the city's revenue comes from property taxes, and on average, 50% comes from the TLT. Due to constitutional limitations on property taxes, services residents have come to rely on are primarily funded by sources other than property tax. 
the property tax rate of 42 cents per thousand dollars of assessed value and the gas tax revenue, which is based on the permanent population of only 600 is essentially flat. Manzanita has one of the lowest property taxes in the state and while not ideal, reliance on TLT without additional support from the property tax base is essential. In April, 2022, the city council adopted resolution 2205 implementing a temporary freeze on the issuance of short-term rental permits in the capped residential zones. Over the last year, the city has established a new short-term rental committee whose mission is to propose policies on Manzanita short-term rentals, which will enhance the city's livability, consider financial health, and inform residents, managers, and visitors about these policies. It is important to remember that tourism is the basis for Manzanita's economy. The overnight visitors are the foundation for which the livability services that the resident population both expects and relies on comes from revenue generated by short-term rental businesses. We must balance both the impacts and the necessary revenue created by our economy with care. The revenue diversification study also identified that the transportation system requires additional funding due to lack of any sustainable funding sources beyond gas tax and franchise fees. Coupled with an increase in maintenance costs and the need for future capital improvements, a new source of funding will be essential for the city to provide a high level of service for our transportation system. This includes the non-auto network, such as creating a safer environment for pedestrians and cyclists. Without meaningful and sustainable funding sources, we will not be able to achieve our goals. In fiscal year 23-24, the City Council will consider adoption of a regional transportation systems plan that was developed through collaborative community process with the cities of Wheeler and Nehalem. This plan includes recommended changes to the city zoning ordinance to implement the policies included in the TSP and will serve as a starting point for developing a system development charge for transportation. It should be noted that a transportation SDC will take time to implement as there are specific rules and laws we must follow to implement an SDC. The TSP identifies pedestrian and cyclist safety and expansion of the pedestrian and cyclist network as a priority. System development charges will not be sufficient for this and maintenance projects will require other sources of funding. The study also identified that day trippers who impact the city and require services are also not contributing and identified options for the city council to consider addressing this lost revenue. Overall, the revenue diversification study examines four options, including a general obligation bond for infrastructure, a prepared food and beverage tax, the transportation utility fee and parking fees for ongoing maintenance and expansion of the transportation system and for livability services to manage the tourism economy. The report will also include a range of other opportunities for consideration. The city council will be discussing these findings and considering options in the coming year. Staff have been playing an important role in revenue diversification and at the direction of city council have been working towards cost recovery for the services the city provides. One of my goals for this fiscal year is not only the reestablishment of a master fee schedule, but setting into place a process for annual updates to these fees to account for inflation and other factors impacting city services. This may also include changes to our intergovernmental agreements. Over the next fiscal year, staff will be examining our IGAs with Wheeler, Nehalem, and Oregon Parks and Recreation for police services and planning, development, building, and public works fees. Staff will work with the City Council to guide these efforts, and the City Council will ultimately decide what to do in terms of cost recovery. However, we are already making progress. In November of 2022, the City Council adopted Resolution 2215, establishing an updated fee structure for short-term rentals, increasing the annual renewal fee to $850 and increasing the inspection fees. This is reflected in the increase in fees for services in the general fund. While staff do not anticipate a need for increasing STR fees for the foreseeable futures, there are still opportunities for fee increases for other city services that are either non-existent or have not been updated for years, including public works right-of-way fees, tree permit review fees, and annexation fees, to name a few. Overall, the city council must take concrete steps to diversify revenue which will not be an easy undertaking. This will require outreach and communication with the community, 
clear policy direction from city council to staff and courage of our community and decision makers to make changes. In addition to that progress, staff have proposed that city council adopt a new system development charge for the storm drain system. OTAP, the city's consultant, using the city storm drain master plan, develop a methodology for a new SDC. Staff presented this methodology to adopt the proposed SDC for the storm drain system. Through this process, staff learned that Ordinance 91-4, authorizing the city to establish system development charges, required updating to bring the city's SDC program in line with the Oregon SDC statute. The city's ordinance was last updated in 1991, and the law was updated in 2003. Staff anticipate the city council will repeal and replace Ordinance 91-4 with an updated ordinance. Staff anticipate the first reading of this ordinance to occur in June and a second reading in July. The proposed budget includes the new storm drain SDC, which is which increased from $174 to $1,699 per connection. Envision Manzanita. Over the last year, staff have engaged with the community on issues impacting livability. Staff organized and held four town halls over the summer and fall of 2022 and summarized that information into a series of themes that will form the basis for a request for proposals to hire a consultant to assist the city in updating the comprehensive plan. The original goal, as supported by the professional services line item in the budget, was to have a consultant on board in fiscal year 22-23. Due to capacity, unanticipated issues, Staff did not have the capacity to advance the RFP this fiscal year. However, it is a priority for the coming year and the delay may actually be to the city's advantage. Senate Bill 406 would apply the state's middle housing code to Tillamook County, including all cities. This means that the city of Manzanita will need to update its zoning ordinance for a greater range of housing types. Throughout the town hall outreach process, affordable and workforce housing were identified as a top priority for our community. With skyrocketing house prices in Manzanita over the last two years, businesses are having difficulty hiring and retaining staff because people simply can't afford to live here. If the community wants a greater diversity of people living in Manzanita, including more full-time residents, those that work in our community and families, then we must address this issue using the most powerful tool local governments have to influence housing, zoning. The comprehensive plan will serve as a catalyst for having robust discussions with our community about who we want to be and how we will get there. No changes to the comprehensive plan or zoning ordinance will be made without thoughtful and meaningful public engagement. The resources that were allocated and unspent for fiscal year 22-23 are proposed to be carried over into this fiscal year to start the comprehensive plan and staff hope to leverage those resources with a grant from the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Finally, a new goal was established this year to establish and support council communication with the community. As the budget message highlights, the city council will be deliberating and implementing some major changes in the coming fiscal year to address issues that have been burning wildly on the back burner for, in some cases, decades. The city council has an enormous responsibility ahead of them and knows that to be successful, clear, fact-based communication will be essential. Resources have been included in the administration's budget to assist the city council in this effort. Staff have also been making a concerted effort to improve communication with the community, including making land use applications more readily available and using the city's website, survey, listserv, water bill, and holding in-person town hall meetings, among other strategies, to inform and engage community members. We're also doing some cleaning of house. Two funds are proposed for closure this year and include the Puffin Local Improvement District, which has been paid off, and the Trust Fund. The Puffin LID is not included in the budget document as there have been no expenditures or revenues received in the last two years. The Trust Fund is, actually I left the table out, so we will include it in the next iteration, but is included in the budget document, but the budget includes a proposal to transfer the remaining funds to the Tourism Promotion Fund to cover the cost of supporting the 4th of July parade. The city has expanded the contract with the Tillamook County Visitors Association to cover volunteer coordination so that the city may extend its liability insurance to volunteers and to cover the cost of developing a donation website for the parade itself. If approved by the Budget Committee, the City Council 
and the City Council, both of these funds will be officially closed by our resolution. This budget proposal also includes the elimination of the Civic Improvement Reserve Department. This department was initially developed to earmark funds from business license renewals and a portion of the short-term rental renewal fee to purchase physical improvements to city property to enhance the livability of the community. In practice, the department has primarily served as a pass-through for funding road facilities and storm drains. According, accounting for these resources is a challenge and the department no longer serves its original purpose. I am requesting the department be dissolved and releasing the restriction of these funds. Releasing this restriction provides more flex flexibility and reduces accounting complexity. The city is in a strong position to set the stage for a financially stable future. To address the complex and challenging livability issues we face for managing our tourism economy and enhancing livability for the people who live here now and creating a path for new residents to also call Manzanita their home. Diversifying revenue and our community can only be for the better, but we must work together to get there. Two years into this job, I feel like we have made significant strides towards these long held goals and we are only just at the beginning. So I leave you with the words of one of Oregon's heroes, former Governor Tom McCall. May we forever prove by our actions that people can join together for mutual benefit and greater good. I hope you'll join me in working together for the greater good and help continue to make Manzanita a place that is welcoming and accessible and a place we can all be proud of. I respectfully submit this this fifth day of May, 2023. Thank you. And I right. thank you. We all thank you too. That's uh it's quite a job, Layla. Thank you. <laughs> the, We're uh, all in it together. Yeah. So now I guess uh I, and thank you for the explanation of the next several pages on the budget document can help people who are maybe are unfamiliar with how the city has organized for finances, have give them some idea of of uh, what all has to be done with the funds that we have. So uh, what do you think? Should we just jump to the general fund, page uh, 33, unless oh, there's anything else you yeah. feel you need to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece. Okay. <laughs> I closed my PowerPoint before it was ready. Yeah. Okay. I just want to echo Dave's point for a moment. You know, I've talked to a few people in the last few weeks who were getting interested in watching these meetings and, and want actually genuinely want to learn more about how things work. So um, when the budget document is posted to the city's website, I'm assuming it will include the preparatory material and the explanations in there. I think <clears throat> I think this is the best this is the best document I've seen in one place at one time in my years of looking at this now that really explains where the money comes from, where it goes, how we're organized, why we're organized, and in particular this year, after a lot of hard work, calls out the challenges that we all face, you know, which helps us get from, whoa, we've got challenges to, okay, yeah, we do. So how are we going to approach them? How are we going to break them down? And we'll get into that into this discussion. But I actually have recommended to a couple of people, I said, uh, you know, if you can't get a hold of a paper copy of this, I'll loan you my workbook because I think for those of us a little older who don't always want to learn stuff online, it's a, it's a great source book. So I think it's useful even beyond um, the budget discussions today. So thank you for that. Thank so, you. And just so, so folks know, the budget document is now posted on the city website now that the budget message has been delivered. Thank you. Do we have any paper copies available at City Hall? That question is... Um, we only prepared those. It's pretty expensive to print and put together. So we've only prepared those for members of the budget committee and department heads. So there is a print uh, ready PDF on the city's website. Folks can print at home. Okay. Or they could print it at the library if they go over there too, because that printer is very fast. So <laughs> I like that. So. I'm trying to be cost effective. So <laughs> okay. um, all right. So, so let's, I'm going to start. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'd say go ahead, please. So I'm going to start just with the revenue piece of this. Um, 
have so many screens, it's hard to manage them all. All right, you can see my PowerPoint there? Yes. Okay. All right, so starting with revenue, um, we had a good discussion about most of the revenue sources at our April 24th meeting, but just to kind of explain to members of the public, uh, we start with what is a carryover balance. So what that carryover balance is, is my estimate as the budget officer of what I believe will be remaining at the end of this current fiscal year. Um, the budget projections are actually a great place to look at how that math is done. So what we start with is the ending fund balance from the 21-22 audit. That's basically like what was left in the account at the end of last year, last fiscal year. And then we go through and we estimate how much revenue will be brought in from the various sources. So from taxes to collections to revenue from agencies. And then add that all up and then subtract our estimated end of year expenditures for the general fund. And that gets us to an estimated carryover balance. The, pro and the property taxes, the um, revenue gathering. Uh, do you want me to wait until the end to ask questions or do you want me to, you know, just talk? Just jump in, at sure. point. Okay. Yes. Um, for your carryover balance, um, I did my own analysis uh, based on what you provide last meeting, the third quarter actual data, and do some um, parading, you know, looking at the trend. I come up with, I'm sorry, I cannot share my screen. I have a little spreadsheet here. I come up with the annualized, I call it annualized, 22, 23 year the fiscal year, the ending fund balance, I see is around 3.8, 3.9 million dollars. And without annualizing it, I realize that the third quarter, if I just take the third quarter actual, the ending fund balance would be at 3.4. So I feel like this uh, number to start with is a little low. Is like 2.6. So I just wonder, you know, I understand how you estimate, and that's why it's so difficult. It's, it's a really hard job to do budget because not only you need to look forward for the 12 months, the next 12 months, you have to start with the base as of your actual data is not there yet. The most you have is the third quarter data. So you have to estimate, annualize the current year. It's not the end yet. You annualize the current year, and then based on the current year, and you um, analysis, and then you look forward to the next twelve months. That's why budget is a really uh, a difficult and, and complex work. So I salute you on doing all that. It's it's not an easy job, um, but um, based on the data I see last quarter, I mean last quarter and the third quarter of this fiscal year, I don't see how you reach the number 2.6. It's a little low for me. So um, if you would like to see my worksheet, I'd love to share with you after the meeting, but then this is my take on it. Maybe you know something that I don't know, I overestimate maybe, but just look at the third quarter, it would be a 3.4 instead of 2.6. So that's that's my two cents here. Well, thank you. And um, just from sort of the philosophy of being more conservative than not, I'm glad that you estimated more than less. So right. that's a plus in our playbook. Um, on page 87, there's a first column. That's kind of how where how the math shakes out for, for me. Um, and it gives you a good sense of where we're projecting those. I actually was able to rely on uh, financial reports that ended in, um, I think the last one we had was April 14th. So I based my end of year estimates on that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so the total revenue that I estimated for the current fiscal year was 4.68 million total. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and that's on page 86. <laughs> and then what I'm estimating, and again, I'm, a, I'm overestimating a little bit of expenditures um, just to have some cushion. I, it's, I estimated that our expenditures would be in the $2 million range. And so if you just subtract that from the 4.6, that gets us to in the 2.6-ish range. Um, yeah, um, my estimate of your annual, well, I would say annualized, the expenditure I have a 1.5, and then um, there must be some something that um, the expenditure increase or some new expenditure that we don't realize in the last quarter that, you know, like I said, you know more than I do. So um, I, transfers, you didn't account for transfers. So those are funds I that don't, aren't. Yeah, the transfer is a net transfer in, so um, it's not going to be in the. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Out. That's close to three hundred thousand. Oh. Okay, I don't count. I did not count the transfer. My annualized expenditure is right at one point six, and then without the last quarter is one point one eight. So um, the last the third quarter actually is. Like I said, it's actual, so I didn't estimate anything. Uh, like I said, if I look at the third quarter actual, no estimation, the end, ending fund balance would be at 3.4 million. It's over what you have there, 2.6. That's what I'm, you know, uh, wondering. Yeah. Unless you have a big expenditure at the end of the year that I'm not counting. Yeah, and that that likely is a function of me being really conservative and B, that we do the transfers in the last quarter. So you okay. may not have, those have not actually occurred yet. So we do those okay. right okay. around now. So it could be like a half a million transfers. Yeah, okay. about 300,000 in transfers. Yeah, because I just, I just concerned that if we start you know, when we start, we start at a wrong number that it, we trickle down there that it will be, you know, under underestimate we all the way down because expenditures is looking at your revenue, you know, how to estimate expenditure, how much we have money to spend. So that's why uh, when I look at it, when I do a budget, I'll be very careful about, you know, the starting point with the revenue. That, that's just my two cents here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Like I said, I'd rather be your yes, estimate. Yes, I understand. <laughs> I so, understand that. Conservative is, is great, um, but we still need to be, you know, uh, being as accurate as possible within the yeah. range in order to make the budget meaningful. May I add I, something? This is Chip. May I add something? Yes, please. Sure. Just uh, listening to your the two of you speak, seems like you're in the same place. Um, if Kit's estimate is 3.4, uh, take the 400,000 and transfers out, that's down to three. So now there's a uh, 2.6 to three, 400,000 dollar difference. Your estimate of end of year end of uh, uh, the expenditures is two. Hers is 1.5. I think that's the difference. You, the transfers were not included in what Kit had. That takes four hundred thousand out, and you estimated the higher expenditures, as you said, to be conservative. So if her expenditures matched yours, then we'd be at the same place or very close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for looking super hard at that, and. Um, I appreciate that that feedback. Um, is there any any other questions about sort of the beginning fund balance or the carryover? Um, we spent a bit of time talking about the TLT, so that's indicated under revenue from collections, so room tax collections. I'll back up to property taxes. We're constitutionally limited on what we can estimate, so. This is sort of the baseline plus 3%. Um, the room tax collections, as I described in the budget message, are 
estimated it. We assumed 2018, we grew by 10% each year and then rounded down. Um, franchise utility agreements, business licenses, those are relatively static um, based on those agreements and um, the revenue we've generated from business licenses in the past. Fees for services is a lot higher. Um, this is also conservative. So we went from $250 per STR license. We have 200 and 60 something, I estimated, or 70, I estimated, I think 220 licenses just to be conservative at 850. And that's what adds that pretty big chunk of cash. So it increases our annual revenue um, by close to 200,000. Um, the revenue from other agencies, so liquor tax, cigarette tax, state revenue sharing are set by um we actually rely on the League of Oregon Cities um, model to estimate those. The IGAs are set by the contracts. Um, you will notice under use of money and property that I have put in a uh, half a million for the sale of old city hall. And when I get to the expenditures for the non department department, we'll talk about why that is. And then we also include transfers in um, from the building fund and from the water fund. And so all that told gets us to $5.3 million in general fund resources. Yeah, that, in, that uh, increase in the fees, uh, that really was a remarkable jump, but I can see uh... Going from what was 160, 250 to 850, that would uh, account for for most of that. But uh, fewer the fees on there where we've been, I guess, deficient in the in the past and not charging everything we should for special fees. That uh, that that looks very nice. Yeah, it makes a big difference for sure. Does so anybody have any? No, please, any other. Just one question on the uh, room tax collections. Do we have a that you, you're estimating uh, 1.3 million? Do we have a, a breakdown between how much of that comes from um, STRs and how much comes from hotels? I don't, uh, Jerry. Um, I don't, and I can talk with Judy about seeing if we can parse that out. Um, but the majority is short term sure. rentals. Okay. We have such hotels in town. Okay. And and uh, on that same topic, do we have yet? It's been a, it's been a full year since we uh, put the temporary freeze on uh, permits. Do we have any indication that that freeze has significantly reduced revenue? Yeah, um, no, I don't believe that it has. Um, we've maintained all of our um, our our existing STR permits and at times have had one or two people on the list. Um, if more development occurs, that could be, that could change, but most of the development that's happened within the uh, city in the capped zones um, have not been for short-term rentals. Well, so, okay, so, so I guess, I guess, the, I guess the freeze wouldn't have reduced the revenue necessarily, but has it's, uh, is there any indication that it slowed the growth that could, could have been anticipated if we didn't have the freeze? Um, you know, I don't have enough information to answer that. I don't, I think anecdotally from what I've seen from the monthly report I get from Judy that, um, and from folks she's talked to, there are folks that, you know, would like to get permits, but haven't gotten themselves on the waiting list. So to me, if we had slowed revenue down, we'd see a long waiting list. Um, that would be an indication to me that that's happening and that we haven't seen. Okay. But it isn't to say that long, longer term, it wouldn't affect us. Mm -hmm. um, we also haven't freed up permits. So the fact that we don't have them freed up could also be impacting the market. But I think without a long um, wait list. Sure. Have, have we seen any information uh, on the uh, or data? I guess you might say on people raising their rental rates because uh, the the coming to the coast remains a hot uh, hot item for vacations. Uh, 
how are, how are, is there any indication of what's happening with the rents on individual houses? I can't speak specifically to the rents, only just the revenue that the city receives. And right, we're tracking right now at, you know, more than 1.5 million just for the general funds, not the uh, tourism promotion fund. Mm-hmm. And seen, I think we've heard from, because um, we checked in with uh, some of the, the rental agencies, they're seeing a decline to some extent in bookings, but the revenue is not declining consistent with the decline in bookings. So I think that that to me, anecdotally, again, would suggest that rental rates are maintaining to some extent. Um, but I just, that's that's not something I track. No, I didn't think so. Yeah, okay. It was anecdotal. Um, so. is, that, is, um, is it possible that we can conduct a survey with the uh, rental property, you know, management company and asking them to project their revenue. I think it's more, you know, accurate from them. I mean, each one of them to uh, tell us what they think instead of we, you know, arbitrary adding a percentage on mm-hmm. on top of last year actual or even in, in, in further estimate being conservative, you know, like that. Is it yeah. possible that to ask them for a survey and, and providing the information? Well, the issue with that is it's a great suggestion, but the issue with that is that we have a lot of independent operators. So we have a lot of folks that independently manage. And mm-hmm. um, I think probably the larger organizations. So we talked to them, Judy is in contact with them. And in fact, it's their feedback that influenced our, you know, my approach to being pretty conservative mm-hmm. about revenue um, this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think I'm I'm a troublemaker here because I, I love did also it. my analysis on the on the percentage. Uh, like I use your approach, ignoring the old COVID year from 2020 uh, to 2022. I um, look at from 2017 the actual through 2022, and I used like 10 percent increase from 2000. Uh, uh, 20 onwards, and then project the next year. My calculation is a little bit different from yours. Here, let me take a look at my different my worksheet here. I use 10 percent, just like what you suggest. The budget uh, for 2023-24, just the TLT, I get to 1.4 million. I mean, what just one million higher than yours, but it's being very conservative, conservative using a 10%, just like what you use. So I'm, mm-hmm. I just want to throw the number out there. And again, um, I I still have the concept of saying that we would like to uh, make the budget as accurate as possible um, instead of overly conservative. We just might take, I'm new here, so my mind from corporate world may not work yet. So you're welcome to uh, correct me. Uh, let me know what I'm thinking is in the right way or I have to change, you know, my practice to to apply to the, to, to the public budget here. Well, if I could just say, I actually appreciate your perspective because when I got here, the year I got here in June 1st, So I brought forward a budget I didn't write. And that year, um, the person that wrote the budget estimated, I think, I don't have it in front of me, but it was really low. It was like $800,000 and we brought in 1.6 million. So I've been trying to do what you're suggesting, which is like I was saying, get a little bit closer to reality, but still really taking um, a conservative approach to to that. So my thinking would be, Kit, and again, I'm I'm 100% on the same page as you. I felt like that was a, a gross underestimation. And the fact that we now have a general fund policy reserve, I think the intent of that was mm-hmm. to have sort of what I called an informal reserve. So if we really grossly underestimate, but we know we're going to cash out a lot, we'll be good because we'll have this huge carryover. 
Mm-hmm. I had to do the math like three times last year to be like, there's something wrong with this. And then when I realized like, oh no, we just underestimated revenue by $800,000. If that's the number, don't quote me on it. Um, I don't have that budget right in front of me right now, but it was- Yeah, you're it, pretty, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and so then, adopted, just so you know, the adopted budget for fiscal year 21-22, which was not my budget, was seven hundred and twenty. Mm-hmm. 8,000. The, um, the actual was uh, 1.6 million. Right. So I, I saw that. Well, not only, that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not only the revenue was underestimated, like you um, put on the um, uh, budget message that the, uh, the expenditure is uh, underestimated as well. So, and the two act together, you have a, a huge, you know, carry over a huge, you know, um, net position gain in the current year. So, um, it's better than deficit. It's a lot better than right. that. But, you know, um, I I'm always say in my mind that, you know, getting closer to reality is, we get us, give us a, a better guiding, the guidelines to look into the future. So I have something. May I speak a second? Because the two of you weren't there. Some of us on this call were there, and we, many of us, felt that even eight hundred thousand was overestimating. Remember, we had a pandemic. The first time we made the budget for twenty one twenty two was it right at the beginning of the pandemic. We had no idea. And I think Catherine can confirm what I said when there was an estimate of 80% of the prior year, we both thought that was too much. And the, yeah, then the I'm second- not, I'm not criticizing it at all. No, no, I, I just want to, I want to point out that when you're making a projection in a completely uncertain environment, you're bound to be a lot more wrong than when you have an ongoing revenue stream to look at. So let's not go back and rewrite history. We did the best we could based on limited information. Now we have better information. But what I don't understand is what was the 10% increase for next year done on? It wasn't, it couldn't have been on 1.1 million, your estimate for the end of. No. So it was based on, um, I took the average rate of growth between fiscal year 13 and 19, and that was 12%. So then I started with fiscal year 18's actual, which was $754,421. And I increased that by 10% to get to fiscal year 24, which is where we are today. And that gets us roughly one3 something million. Um, I can pull the spreadsheet up right now, but that's that's what it's based on. And I think the other thing, Chip, um, 100% agree is, and I think Kit to speak to being conservative is TLT is a really, um, it's hard to estimate. It's very variable. We don't know what will happen. It's not like it's a consistent revenue stream that you can really rely on so by being more conservative and i think that that's probably what the budget committee has done in the past to say you know you know maybe tickets to europe drop to 200 bucks and people decide to go to italy instead of coming here like we just don't know and so i wanted to kind of continue that tradition of what the budget committee did which i think was incredibly responsible which is to say um we should be more conservative, but I also want us to be a little bit closer to the reality. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's a big reason why we have those. Okay. That is, okay. I, I'd like to echo what say? Chip was saying because I was on the budget committee when we all of a sudden were sitting around and, and uh, Mike Scott had said, we got to close the city. Nobody's going right? to be showing in the budget committee's meeting and we're looking at each other, well, what are we going to do now? And it really made quite obvious the the hazard that the city was left in when its uh, property tax rate was left so low because we were going to be, we had no idea what was going to happen. It's like, oh God, what now? So we 
crank down the uh, estimated uh, revenue, not knowing when we would be fully open again. But the it happened. We were, the uh, rental agencies were able to figure out protocols for making things safe for people to come down here, and then they just the tap opened up a little, opened up a little, and by the next year, we realized we had brought in more in transit room tax than we would have put on, than we would have expected or budgeted for if there had been no pandemic. So it's like Chip was saying, we were just sort of making it up and we were very lucky. So uh, it was a, it was a trying time. So, but I would say a lot of money being left and putting us in a really strong position. So mm-hmm. it was a good move. So I'm, I'm not gonna go to the past. I'm gonna take go forward now because it's has been illustrated very well. And this is the beauty of having a new perspectives and people who've been here and listening to each other and understanding the picture. So this is great. And I appreciate um, what you're already bringing to the budget committee kit, it's good. Right. I would say, I think going forward, Um, This is a challenging number to forecast. Nonetheless, it probably represents the next kind of set of evolution we get get to in terms of how we prepare a better, a tighter budget and forecast more tightly. So I just see that as kind of one of the things in the hopper that, that staff will continue to work on and we'll be able to refine it and look at a little bit more um, in terms of the variables involved. Um, we're not ready for that yet, and that's okay. The The last couple of years have really been about making progress, and I think we've got some room to even develop that a little bit further, but it's not a, a huge priority for this year in terms of where you spend your uh, focus and time on forecasting. So, yes, forecasting is always hard. I don't care what people are forecasting. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met a person forecasting anything. And that's a lot of different things who said, this is a piece of cake. I'll give you an accurate number three to five years out. I mean, that's just not the. No, forecasting is in. like you wish you had a crystal ball. That's all. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll get to it. I, I'm, I'm fully confident. I appreciate you guys. You know, it's, it's just a learning process for me. Sure. I mean, yeah. if I don't ask, I will never learn. That's my approach. I'm glad you are. Uh, and I and I hope this is all illuminating to the to any audience that we've got too to understand the what really goes into deliberations by the budget committee and, and the city council and the staff on how do we pay for this wonderful city we're trying to keep going. So right. Okay. Anybody have any other questions on that? On the on particularly on the, the amount of TLT we can think about coming in, you know. So. Okay, back to Layla. Okay. All right. Well, actually, I'm going to kick it over to Eric so um, he can go home. So I'm going to stop sharing and have the chief take over and present his departmental budget. Okay. Can I? I need to get permissions to share. We can make that work. You should be good to go. Okay. Did that work? Yes. So just to cover again who we are, I've been here for just over 20 years now. Um, Officer Mike Sims is 12 and a half. John Garcia is nine and a half, and Sean Mumi is at six and a half now. So in the current fiscal year, um, some of the things that we did, uh, we purchased um, Axon body-worn cameras. Part of that purchase was with the assistance of a CIS grant that we received um, for the actual hardware. Um, Part of the body-worn cameras is having the um, software program to store all the evidence that's created. <clears throat> and Axon has its own software program called evidence.com. And we have started um, leveling up the department and going paperless by using that program. Um, we're transitioning to all police case files that we have now are stored on evidence.com. 
And so we'll have, there will be no more um, actual police, police case files in file cabinets anymore. Um, we've gone through and um, purged up to the retention uh, time limit. Um, felonies are about 10 years. Some cases are forever, but um, misdemeanors are about five years. So we've kind of got rid of about 20 years worth of files this, um, this last year. Um, using that evidence.com program, um, we're able to take the case files, which include the digital files, either an audio or a body cam video or anything else that we upload or scan into the program. We can just share it directly with the Tillamook County District Attorney. And in the past, we would have had to make um, photocopies of everything and burn um, videos and photos and everything else onto CDs and then physically drive those reports down to the Tillamook Courthouse. So it's saved a lot of time and uh, just uh, it's been a lot easier. It's been a learning curve, but it's been easier. Um, another thing that we did this past year was signed up for uh, Police One Academy online training. Um, it's actually owned by Lexapol, which is who we um, have our policy manual through. And the cost is less than $100 um, per officer per year. And there's over 400 online courses available. And part of that is um, every three years, we're, we're all, all officers are required to have um, 84 hours of total training. And those trainings are broke down into different categories. And we can actually fulfill that whole um, 84 hours using that course that we purchased. <clears throat> so we're still going to courses that we can find or um, ones that are in person that um, can help better um, like investigative skills or whatever we need. But this program has offered um, the ease of obtaining our um, required uh, training hours. And then uh, one of the big things was we were scheduled to purchase a patrol car last year. And last I heard, it still has not been built by Ford, still from the um, supply shortages. Yeah. So this coming year, um, that... Uh, patrol car that was supposed to be purchased last year will be carried over to next year. So we'll plan on replacing two patrol cars if we can get them this year. Uh, the cost of the vehicles has increased significantly. Um, the car that we were supposed to purchase this fiscal year, just the base car model was $10,000 more than the one the previous year. Um, same car, same build, everything was exactly the same, except it was $10,000 more. And then the uh, parts that go into it to finish the build have increased also. Um, with that being said, uh, we're increasing the transfers in to the reserve fund to keep up with that growing cost of vehicles. So in 14 more years, when we have to replace more cars, we'll actually have that money in reserve and not fall um, in the negative. But the next car, after we purchase these two cars, the next vehicle won't need to be purchased until at least fiscal year 27, 28. Um, we're going to continue working to improve the paperless process. Um, it's been a learning curve and we've been using Adobe and other programs to, to try to reduce the amount of papers that we have to print out and um, go back and forth or file. Um, I'm planning on um, appointing a police sergeant this next fiscal year that was approved by the uh, council. And that um, police sergeant position will um, need to attend um, leadership trainings. And one of their main tasks will be to train and supervise the code enforcement position, um, which is the next thing is to hire and train the code enforcement position. And that person will be a, a delays on between short-term rental community and the city, attend the short-term rental committees, be part of that committee. They'll have to learn all the city ordinances, uh, learn different civil laws, probably some criminal laws, and be involved in um, community outreach programs. So that brings us to the budget. And um, uh, personnel costs increase from cost of living mainly. And um, I'm not uh, Nina would have to talk about any of the, pay, uh, the benefits or expenses increase. Um, but the, the one main thing I'll point out is the dues and subscriptions increased. Um, that price is including the evidence.com data program storage. 
Um, so the body cameras are obviously producing a, a ton of data and we're required by law to retain those for a certain period of time. Luckily, the program has built into it that every, every video or case file, anything we upload, we can um, tag it to a category and it is automatically purged at the time that it's set for retention for Oregon. So once we upload it and tag it, it automatically um, purges as we go. But that uh, increase um, in data storage, it works out to be uh, roughly $100 an officer per month. And so at this point, about $1,200 for just the axon evidence.com storage. Um, and that price is locked in for at least a five-year period. Um, so that's the main dues and subscription increase besides our um, re the report program and the CAD program that um, is in our cars that we communicate with dispatch. Those are an ongoing agreement that have about a 5% increase every year. Um, I think that's the main increase. Is there any questions on this page? Is all this data just stored in the cloud? It is. No. Um, it's owned by our department, but it is stored um, in the cloud, yes. And it's uh, that storage is owned by the evidence.com, which is Axon, which was formerly Taser, um, and a very, very popular system for police agencies in the United States to be using. And I should say, every single agency in the county now is using that evidence.com program to um, upload our data and provide um, the DA with our reports. And so all the agencies now are um, submitting reports the same way as we are. Thank you. Uh, no more questions. I'll go to the next page, um, which is the reserve fund. So this reflects an increased transfer. We had been at 26,200 every year. Um, we upped it to 30 and um, depends on the rate of increase of vehicles and cost to upfit the vehicles. We'll have to evaluate that every year going forward, but um, that or maybe just a slight increase at the same rate as inflation every year is what we might have to look at for the future transfer ends. And then the, um, Replacement, the 50,000 that was adopted last year obviously is not going to be spent. And so, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously isn't going to be spent. It could be a miracle that the car gets delivered by the end of June, and we might pay some of that out of this budget year. But more than likely, we will not be spending that money, which would be carried over into um, the proposed carryover balance for this year. But I'm uh, asking to spend 125000 this year. I'm hoping to not have to spend that much. But um, with the unknown for the cost of a vehicle and unknown for the parts, um, I have it at that rate just to, just to have enough to be able to build two cars if need be. And that's all I have if there's no questions. Yes, not Well... Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You know, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the one thing that jumped out at me was the reserve line. What, what, what's the reason for the dramatic change there? The reserve. This is page 80 in the book for those of you who are trying to find it. <laughs> um are you at the which number are you which number are you looking at okay under expenditures reserves it 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 dropped it, it was 107 in uh 2021 and now it's going to be 7850 so that's um if we don't if we don't purchase the car this year it should be you know 57 right 57850 no we're looking at something different I'm looking at the line below the equipment, the vehicle. The, that's $7,850? Yeah. That's saying what would be left if I purchased the two vehicles this year 
at 125,000. That's how much would be left in the reserve account. But if I don't spend the 50,000 before July 1st this year, that number is going to going to change and be 57,000 850. And maybe Eric, so it's because we're spending all the money. That's why Correct. to buy. Correct. Okay. Then we are. And then Eric we're has a schedule. Right. Yes. Not then we won't be purchasing money. another vehicle for till 27, 28 fiscal year. And so then that 30,000 a year transfer in will build back up. I see. Okay. So the relationship is uh, looking at the line that's starting 107,000 under reserves, you're transferring money into that, which then gets spent on the line above, which is the vehicle replacement. Is that correct? Yes, with the 26 transferred in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there'll be um, three to four years after this year without any expenditures. And so that should be able to build up um, another 120,000 before we start purchasing vehicles again. Do you have any other questions, Chair? Uh, where were you? Who was speaking? Oh, sorry, I was just saying, can we move on? <laughs> Jerry, did you have anything else? Uh, that wasn't me. That was Chip talking. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm using my small screen. So I guess we'll move on. Okay. Nice right. job, Mike. Thank you. All right. Okay. Now we're on to the administration. So, um, here we are. Okay, so personnel services. So I inserted in this year's budget an FTE chart because we we fund bits and pieces of positions as well as uh, certain positions are 100% funded by the general fund. So, um, well, even you know Eric's positions are all funded by the general fund. For the administration, however, we do cover 4.6 FTE. That includes 100% of my FTE, 100% of our accounting manager, just Nina's FTE, and 100% of our short-term rental program manager's FTE, which is Judy. The assistant city recorder, which is Nancy, we is covered in 0.6 of her FTE is covered in this budget. Um, we actually increased, and so this is one of the things in addition to the 6% COLA, um, Scott's FTE is our development services manager for the role he plays in uh, short-term rental inspections and then managing planning applications. We actually increased that from last year um, because we're seeing more activity there than in the building fund to 30%. The administration also budget includes 50% uh, of the planning and permit tech, which is our Chris Bird. And then we also included 20% of the new code enforcement position in the administration's budget. And so that is the increase in, um, in addition to the COLA, which is the cost of living adjustment. So we cover 4.6 FTE. In terms of our m and um, building operations, uh, we've seen increases in costs for electricity. So we accounted for some of that here um, with a little bit of flex. Um, and stationary and supplies, we're tracking similarly to as we have in previous years. As noted in the budget document, we did see some pretty significant increases in insurance, and so those are reflected here. Um, advertising, so this is when we have to issue notices. So notices, for example, for this meeting in the Headlight Herald, um, we've maintained that line item because of our past uh, actuals track pretty close to that. Uh, planning and zoning. So this actually accounts for um, some of the services that we get for, um, I'm sorry, this accounts for the planning applications in which we get fees for. So there's actually a cost recovery element to this piece. So when applicants apply, 
And then the hours that we pay our contract planner to review their application, um, that they're paid out of this line item. Building services, maintenance and supplies, we should reduce this number because we, um, we clean the bathrooms ourselves. Yes, we do. Um, and we just wanted to account with the actuals that we've seen in the past several years. And so in our little building, we don't, um, we don't use a lot of resources for that. The professional services line item, the big one, um, this accounts for, um, you know, we talked about this at the last budget hearing meeting. So this accounts for kind of our essential services. So the city attorney, this accounts for our information technology contract. This accounts for professional planning services. So this is beyond um, just the application review. Um, this accounts for our financial software and support. Um, so there's a professional services component to that. The auditor, and then we have some miscellaneous funds included in that. This is also where council goals are allocated. So there's a pretty significant chunk included in here. I'm estimating about 150,000 for the update of the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance. Um, there are resources here for leveling up and budgeting forward. And one of the things I mentioned in my budget proposal is that um, I would like to continue working with the financial uh, government financial professional to help revise and set of fiscal financial policies for the city. Um, I would like for the city to be able to develop a budget workbook and enhanced, so we can have enhanced budget reporting and templates. Um, the budget tools that we have now, which I'm proud of, I created them from scratch, based them on um, the previous city manager's um, work, are challenging. And um, in other cities I've worked in, we've had really um, more sophisticated models, much like what we were able to do with a projection model. And so I think it's in the best interest of the city to have something that's a bit more professional and that's transferable um, so that when I leave, somebody else can just step in and take over. Um, I had to recreate all of this from scratch and um, it is just an, an enormous amount of work and having something that is, um, again, transferable that can be used in future years that actually just transfer straight into the budget document. We have to do a lot of um, gymnastics to transfer what's in my spreadsheet to get them into a format that people can understand. Um, and so I'm actually, that's one of my top priorities and hopes um, is to do that work and then to get some ongoing um, financial advising support um, and there's also resources included in this line item to support council communication goals. Um, the travel and training I did increase slightly to account for um, more increased interest of counselors wanting to attend um, conferences. And so I budgeted for council members to be able to attend one to two conferences per year. Um, we would pay for their, their admission, but not necessarily can afford to pay for their um, overnight stays. Uh, the dues and subscription number increased to account for the cost of renting the Pine Grove. So that we estimated about $8,000 um, increase, and then we wanted to account for inflation. And dues and subscriptions, just so you know, include all of our dues for things like the Oregon Mayor's Association, OCCMA, ICMA, the League of Oregon Cities, AOC, LCOG, EDC, um, all the acronyms. It accounts for all of those things, plus our postage, our copier, um, all of our bank service fees, and then other uh, technical fees that we have associated with um, our software, um, our alarm system, and then backup storage and licensing and things of that nature. So that's included in that number, but the jump is to account for going into in-person meetings. And so that includes some additional meetings on top of the city council meetings if we choose to have a few uh, in-person meetings. And then capital outlay, uh, we just kept that consistent. We actually purchased a help purchase a plotter. We split that between uh, three departments this year. So that's a big improvement for us. Um, so that's the administration's expenditure budget. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, Layla, I had a question. Um, sure. uh, 
Josh's technical services, are those under professional services or are, are those part of that? Professional services, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is it possible? I know that we looked at professional services at our um, last meeting. Is it possible to get that breakdown and see where allocations are? Yeah, I can share that with you. I just, my not concern right is that they're <laughs> estimates. So, you know, I estimate approximately like 270 for the essential services because we've had some increases in legal fees, some that were unanticipated and not budgeted for. So I actually increased that number. It was 250 last year. So I increased it to 270. Um, as I said, the Envision Manzanita, I'm hoping it's around 150. Um, I hope no consultants are watching because it could be less, it could be more, depending on how big a scope we have. So I want the flexibility. One thing I will note is that any contracts that get signed will come to council first. So you will have the opportunity to review um, the proposal and um, sign off on those contracts. And that will be managed within the framework of this allocation. Okay. Maybe we can get a cheat sheet for that then. Yeah. Taylor, can I just uh, kind of after the fact, but can I just take you back to that uh, two seventy figure for uh, the core services? I because you were talking about attorneys' fees. I don't want anybody to think we're paying two hundred seventy thousand for the city attorney. No, right. That's only a portion of that. Right, and you don't. Do you know what that portion is? I estimated. Um, so I carried a hundred thousand last year for that, and we're getting close um and i did 125 for this year is my my estimate okay um i do know what josh's contract will be because i'm bringing that to you next month um but it's about 50,000 a year and that includes that's also an increase i should mention because um for his services to to come and set up all of the in person meeting um stuff for uh, our city council meetings so that's incorporated into his new contract Okay, and then uh, uh, switching gears a little bit on the um, the new uh, code enforcement person, you're saying uh, twenty percent uh, comes out of uh, uh, your personnel uh, budget. I didn't I didn't see any noted under the uh, under Eric's report. He had uh, just the four officers uh indicated so where where how else is that position paid for yeah that's a great question um so page 17 shows that allocation so 20 percent is out of the admin so that is correct we're assuming five percent will come out of building um because okay. we expect this person to do some building code enforcement on weekends and then 75 percent and i'll go through the oh. tourism promotion fund that's where the majority. Thank but, you. Um, yeah, no problem. The funds don't necessarily determine what department people are in. So right. that's okay. why for folks that are watching page 16 shows how we're organized. Page 17 shows how people are paid. Perfect. So thanks for clarifying the attorney fees, Jerry, because I had missed that. So you're just to confirm yes. it's 125,000 for attorney fees of the yes. 500,000. Okay. And that's good. And just to make sure people know, we don't want to spend $125,000. We'd like to spend a lot, lot less than yeah. that. But, you know, for example, our Luba um, appeal costs the city some scratch. And so we just need to be making sure we have those resources in case we need them. Yeah, and this is good. And I view this as kind of part of just general education for all of us. These things and these kind of costs, typically people don't know they occur. And it doesn't mean that we would do anything any differently, but there's, you take an action and there's a financial cost to doing it. And that's something that the city bears. I think given the environment we have around us in the county and otherwise, um, around short-term rentals, around people with different proposals for that have to do with property rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's good to have some cushion in here for this. I also think, I mean, I was thinking about a gentleman um, 
who had a comment a couple of, maybe it was two years ago. Well, I can remember this, don't ask me, but two years ago in the in the budget thing, you know, he was asking about why why some of these costs have gone up. And part of the question is, what do we now think is our sustainable or required amounts? You know, so are we, based on what we're trying to accomplish as a city, based on, and the goals that are set, based on where we are with staffing now, based on getting into some projects that are going to be more complex, like the comprehensive planning. Do you feel like this half million is about in the zone of what if a city our size with the goals we have, is that about feel about right to you, Layla, or is this an area that'll continue to grow? Um, I think it's actually an area area that we'll see some decline in because the comprehensive plan update is it's a multi-year but it's sort of a one-time thing so once the plan's updated um i actually see those requirements going back down but that depends if city council has um additional goals that come i can't predict what those goals will be um but i think that if we were just to go back to sort of essential services, I can see that number hovering in the $300,000 range. Um, like I should also note that the increase in attorney's fees is that if we're making zoning code changes, our attorney has to review those things. Um, so I think in terms of maintaining what we're doing, that five, half a million is, is, is a lot, but that's primarily because of the what we'll need in order to update the comp plan and the zoning ordinance. Those are those are very expensive and big lifts. Um, and hopefully he has technical assistance grants uh, that come up this year. They're every two years. Um, so we may not need all of that, but we should plan for it in order to achieve the goals that the council and the community are expecting of us. Thank you for so that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and for the person who's got no context and isn't even thinking about COVID, I mean, it's one of the lines that really jumps out at you on this page. You go from basically just under $100,000 a few years ago to five. So it's a big right. jump, but it's an explainable jump and it's tied to the city's major goals. So thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we added IT, we added new financial software, um, we did a lot of things that have actually made the city run a lot better. Do you anticipate the cost, the professional services cost, uh, will remain high in the future, or once we get the system, like the financial system, software running smoothly, then we don't need to? um maintain such a high budget for that professional services yeah. no, that's a great question i think the essential services will stay fairly consistent um which includes our financial services software and those costs i believe have gone down um but this line item is where we carry the council goals so i can't predict what council wants to do and what we'll be able to accomplish so mm -hmm. it really depends. And I think those goals will be related to what our available resources are. So we'll just have to right size um, depending on um, where we are. You know, we should, I should note that the city is trying to solve problems that have been festering for 30 years. So we're doing a lot in these last couple of years that city hasn't done. So I think it's natural that we would see more resources allocated towards these. Um, and I think once we kind of get ourselves leveled up, we get ourselves set in terms of um, the update to our comp plan and our zoning ordinance, we won't require as much. But if council wants to change the world and do something different, then we'll have to adjust at that time. Um, but it will all, all be resource dependent. Um, but since this is a priority for the community and the council, and we do have available resources, it's why I'm recommending that we do this. 
Um, and one thing we did last year, which is why I was able to report out to you in detail at the last budget meeting, what we've spent the money on is we create project codes for this so that we can clearly show both you and the community how this money is being spent. And it's an account on our side, it, it makes it a lot easier. Whereas previous years, it was just all dumped into sort of that line item. We actually now, um, Nina and I, have project codes that we can say we've spent X dollars on attorney's fees, X dollars on these projects within the attorney's fees and so forth. So that we can have that transparency be um, available for, for the public. It's a, it's a good enhancement on your system with the coding. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Next, court department, right? Yeah, court. So, court's pretty standard. Um, you'll see actually the costs for court have um, sort of leveled out. So, again, uh, this includes 0.4 FTE, so that's Nancy. So, a little less than half her job is running the court, dealing with citations, et cetera. Um, we actually took out building operations because she lives with us. So, you know, one of the things you'll know that there's, we pay for electricity and internet and all that stuff in three different buildings right now. And that's not incredibly cost effective, but having Nancy in the office, um, this is a more accurate reflection of what those costs are. And those costs are actually absorbed by the fire district who lets us use their facility for free um, for the last two years. Um, so we've been couch surfing there um, without our own space. Uh, stationary supplies, again, is pretty consistent with past years uh, and all the other fees as well. So no major increases here. Um, the dues and subscriptions have gone down. So this is one of those things that um, is now reflected in the admin's budget. Um, but we got a new module for um, our court system. And so we were able to um, reduce some other costs elsewhere. So happy to take any questions about court. Look, Leila, I was looking for, there must be, I mean, the court generates revenue and I guess that's listed in under general fund revenue fines. Yes. Okay. Um, but it, it's a relatively modest number. It doesn't cover, um, the cost, uh, the full cost of the court, um, which, and I'm just curious if that's, uh, you know, what's typical around Oregon for uh, the kind of municipal court we have, which serves a few different communities. Um, is it, do some of them pay for themselves or is it typical that? You know, I, um, in my freshman year, made a comment about that last year saying we don't make enough revenue to cover the cost and i got a call from the judge the next day <laughs> um and his opinion is it's not just about the revenue it's a community service that we provide so right. i'm just gonna yeah. and it is a community service but it's a it's a community it's a regional service essentially right yeah because we provide we provide um because of our relationship with oregon parks Nehalem and yeah. Wheeler. Um, and one of the things that our IGAs with them do is that we actually remit the citation dollars back to Wheeler and Nehalem, which pay for the IGAs. Um, so I mentioned we'd be talking about renegotiating those IGAs. Yeah. I tried to get Eric to write more tickets, but those guys are about education and community outreach. And so I respect that. Um, and I'll defer to the chief on how to how to do that. But I don't want Judge Blake calling me except to say hi. So. Right. No, it's <laughs> it's a it's a small amount. I'm just I was just curious. I I guess yeah, I it's a great question. And, it, and it had been. I think it had been. Uh, it looked like the the fine revenue was higher going back a few years. Uh, yeah. Um, we'd almost think that with more activity in the last couple of years in town, that might have uh, gone up as opposed to the other way, but. All right. Yeah. Just I can make a quick uh, comment on that. During COVID, we had so many day trippers here and in the area that we actually wrote more parking tickets and 
um, other tickets just because there were so many people coming down here during the COVID period. So it was actually a, a spike in the amount of citations we wrote. Got it. Okay. And new code enforcement officer, we might see more parking. That's right. <laughs> And another big thing, too, is some of the fine revenue or, uh, was Judy getting, like, oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. huge, huge fines for short-term rental violations mm -hmm. when we first started to crack down on the legal um, licensing and different things that Judy found. So a lot of that revenue was generated from her as a short-term rental enforcement um, position. I remember sitting in the court one time when Larry, the judge, was holding a uh, discussion with a person uh, regarding uh, uh, short-term rental, illegal rentals, and the guy was facing a fine of $1.4 million. And I was thinking, hey, that would be incredible. But he didn't, he didn't assess the guy that much. Uh, one other question, question I had, I had to step out for a minute the, uh, to put the chicken in the oven. The the uh, uh, what are the prospects of the court opening up to the public again? Um, as long as we're at the fire station, I mean they're open to the they're not open to the public now. No, I think as long as we're at the fire station, we're um, following their protocols. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we have our own space. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? Oh, I, I did. Why, why are there two separate lines that say professional services, municipal judge? Yeah, I was just noticing that. I think one is, um, I'll double check on that. No. Might have just been a typo, transcription yeah. error. Um, I think he has a line item for um, reimbursable no. type stuff. So. Not donuts, I guess. I All right, sorry. If okay. I had the budget call where it just transferred, these kinds of things wouldn't happen. <laughs> okay. My two cents. Okay. On to the next. Yes, please. Parks. So the parks department. Um, again, the FTE chart will explain the weird point one two, but our public works staff uh, maintain the city parks. Um, so you know, again, the general fund is is paying for 0.12 of all of the staff in the public works department. Um, this includes insurance for our parks, our grounds maintenance. I increased this. We discussed this when uh, Ben Pittenger was here to um, talk about our partnership with the land trust. And so that's incorporated in this line item. And then parks, utilities. Uh, so this pays for... Uh, the electricity and other things um, on that site. Uh, the janitorial supplies, you'll see this number has dropped dramatically because we actually moved this into the TLT, the transit, I'm sorry, the tourism promotion fund because it pays for the toilet paper and the paper towels for visitor facilities. So that was moved last fiscal year. Uh, city parks and maintenance, uh, I increase this, again, to account for any resources that might be needed at Palco Meadows, um, and then vehicle equipment supplies and repair. So that's just uh, a number that we carry there for, we have a little uh, vehicle that we, well, that public works staff drive around to um, maintain those facilities. So that comes out of this budget. Um, so we're actually tracking a little less than what was adopted last year and tracks more with the actuals for 21-22. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, the non-department fund. So um, in this, we have under the materials and services line item. So the council committed 10,000 a year to um, emergency preparedness. We also make a donation to EDCNV out of this line item. Uh, what we do is we um, subtract the amount of resources that were spent from the previous year and then add $10,000. So uh, Dan purchased um, quite a few items uh, for the for emergency preparedness, an emergency trailer and some other things. So that is accounted for here. Um, what left us with about $18,000 in our estimate. And so I added 10,000 to get us to 28. Um, the COVID relief 
money is here and we'll actually be working with council hopefully over the next couple of months to allocate those funds. Um, there's some talk uh, due to the um, debt discussions happening at the federal level that they're going to claw back money that hasn't been allocated. So we want to get on that toot suite and um, get those resources dedicated. Um, but it shows up in this line item as an expenditure. Can I just, uh, can you just give us a okay. quick description, Layla, of what the possible uses for that money would be that would be legit? Yeah, and I might actually punt that to Nina, who's here, but we can actually use it for facilities. So we could actually allocate some of this money to uh, the City Hall project if it moves forward. Um, and there's other funds that I can't remember right now, but okay. if Nina's on, she might be able to speak yeah. to that. Hang on one second. Maybe she is in. We can come back to it. It's not critical okay. for right now. There's four categories. Yeah. Um, lost revenue, facilities, infrastructure in the city for like broadband, um, water and sewer things. I'd have to look at my thing to refresh myself, but there's four okay. main categories. But one that we think would probably be a good option is for the use of new city hall, which would... Um, Anything that helps with like health related safety, so um, an HVAC thing or something. Oh, I see. Okay. Like that. Thank yeah. you. No Thanks, problem. Nina. Yeah. And, you know, council will be the body that determines what those funds are used for, and we'll present the options to council and they can decide. But we do need to show it here as an expenditure if we do want to use it this year. Hmm. Um, so transfers out. So this is where all the transfers live that go out of the general fund in, into other funds. And you guys have always all, all heard me wax on about how we subsidize a lot of our infrastructure through the general fund. And this is where that happens. Uh, so this year, to continue the tradition of making sure the road fund is uh, viable, we'll be transferring 100000 into the road fund. Um, when we get to the road fund tomorrow, you'll see that there is um, how many FTE? There's almost one full FTE assigned to the road fund. And so that basically, that's a significant amount of resources. So um, so that's proposed. Uh, the Public Safety Equipment Reserve Fund, as Chief talked about, so this includes that $30,000 transfer. Uh, this includes a proposal for a $700,000 transfer into the City Hall Expansion Fund. I just want to remind folks that I did estimate $500,000. Um, we think it'll be more uh, based on the offer that we have just accepted on City Hall um, into the general fund. So it will, the previous budget, last year's budget showed the money from the sale of old city hall going into the city hall fund because we don't have that money in hand i'm proposing that we transfer it from the general fund and then when we sell city hall that money just goes back into the general fund so it should be a net net uh it also includes funding for the debt service payment so you know the, there's a chart in the um budget document that shows the city's outstanding debts I believe it's on page that was a nice addition yeah page 26 um the only debt that is paid out of the general fund is under hill plaza but the city's tradition has been to pay it out of the city hall construction fund so that's essentially what this is doing um, the transfer includes, is intended to include that, which is $155,000 a year. And that debt sunsets or that debt is paid off midway through fiscal year 27, 28. So when you look at the budget projections, you start to see the revenue go back up, which usually doesn't happen, is because that debt is done. We only pay half a debt service payment in 27. It includes enough money to do the abatement and demolition of the buildings that are on Underhill Plaza. And it includes enough money that should council determine that they want to proceed with phase two to for the city to enter into a phase two contract with the owner's representative and the architect. Um, and I'll talk about the city hall expansion fund because 
700,000 isn't enough to pay for all of that. We do have some carryover in the city hall expansion fund, though that transfer combined with the carryover provides sufficient resources to accomplish all of those things. Uh, We also, oh, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, you were talking about our outstanding debt. And um, could you elaborate a little bit on the water revenue bond? I've had some questions from um, people about that. And it looks like it goes to yeah. 35. And could you tell us what that was about? And uh, Sure. And there might be others here, too, who can weigh in on that. But that is our well system. So the city uh, moved from surface water to a well system. And that uh, that debt is to pay that off. And that is paid out of the water utility. Thank you. So there's yeah. one other thing to mention, uh, Brad, and that is <clears throat> this uh, debt was refinanced a few years ago, 2018, I think, uh, to uh, lower the debt service because of lower interest rates. And it's not only, just to be clear, it's not only just the wells system, it's the whole transmission system from the wells to the city. Yeah, thanks. That's an important clarification. And that's and paid out of the water. And then visitor centers paid out of the um, restricted tourism um, promotion fund. Is the new water system complete already? Yes. So we are in the new system? Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, So in terms of reserves, we have an operating contingency of $129,000. So this is money that um, if we need to transfer for some reason, um, we will. And then our general fund policy reserve, this represents 17.5% of the operational costs uh, for the general fund. And then the unappropriated ending fund balance. So this is resources that are not allocated to anything is 1.6 million. So the total reserves gets us to one 2.1. And then one of the things I did this year is to make sure everyone knows in Oregon, we have to have a balanced budget. So everything has to be allocated somewhere. So the total general fund non-department expenditures includes that materials and services of 175, the total transfers of 855, the total general fund reserves, including the unappropriated ending fund balance of 2.1 to get us to 3.189. And then it includes all the expenditures for the administration, public safety, court, and parks. Gets us to a balanced budget of $5.3 million. So I think one way to just look at this, too, is that after all that's said and done, um, we still have reserves of $2.15 million. Good. Does anybody yeah. have any questions? Uh, we've come to the end of the uh, what was planned for today. No. Yeah. Uh-uh. We have two more. Two more. I want to touch on them because they're related. To these okay. funds, it's pretty quick. Unless you want please to be do. here all night tomorrow. No, please do. Okay. Um, but just make sure are there any other questions about. Okay. Right. So the City Hall Construction Fund. Um, so I got a, you know, a question. I'm sorry, I don't, oh, mean sure. I don't mean to interrupt. No. Are you talking sure. about having a uh, master fee schedule in place at some point? Uh, mm-hmm. When would we expect that? And uh, would that include like SDCs? Uh, would it be a tied to the construction index or inflation? Or I just like to know a little yeah. bit about that. Sure, that's a great question. So staff will start working. We are working on it. We actually have a draft. Um, it will include all the fees that the city charges. And uh, I know we had one before. I think the last one we had that I could find was 2013. So it's basically a schedule. So it says, here's what we charge. You guys decide. So for example, when you, as a council, if you elect to adopt the system development charge 
for stormwater, you can also elect to increase that every year by inflation. And the point of having a master fee schedule is that we do it all at once. We're sort of reminded to do it together. Um, and that will include all the city's fees. So right now what we're doing is looking at what fees do we have? What fees do we not have? And what fees should we be establishing? So the short-term rental fees, for example, will be included on that list. The water SDC, the storm SDC, the parks SDC, that'll be all on that list. Um, it will also include all the public works fees, all the planning fees, um, our business license fees. So all of those things. And then my goal is to get it where we do an annual update to the um, master fee schedule that based on what council decides by a resolution or ordinance, we're increasing those to account for inflation, I think as you just asked, um, but you have to make those decisions on a case by case basis when it comes to the SDC. Um, but we can, as staff, propose um, other fee increases if they're needed. Um, but it's just a way to organize our fees because we've just been sort of doing them as one-offs um, so you did a resolution to adopt all the STR fee changes. I'd rather see us do that as a kind of concerted whole um, every year. So that's the goal. Um, I'm hoping to have a draft of some proposed new fees. Um, I'm going to say by the end of the year um, so that by the time we get to the budget next year, that then allows um, staff the ability to make better projections about what kind of resources we can accept. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. So I'm uh, looking forward yeah. to it. Cool. So I jump into the City Hall Construction Fund. Um, um, I just did one. Page number. Sorry. Page number. Sorry. 74. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, a couple of folks have asked me, and sorry, this is again, if we didn't have, um, and that's right, so why do we have this money? Um, we didn't sell City Hall this fiscal year. Um, I don't expect that we'll close on City Hall this fiscal year, so that's why we didn't get the revenue that we expected from City Hall. Um, the market also changed dramatically from the point that we listed the property um, to where we are today. So we are expecting that to come in um, a bit less. But just so folks know, like, why did you estimate you would have this money? It's again, we're projecting, we're hoping, um, we feel pretty solid now that we're under contract with a buyer on City Hall, that those funds will come in. So if we take that out of the picture um, with what we spent so far on contract services, on the due diligence that we've already completed, the studies, the geotech, all that, I'm estimating conservatively that we'll have about $220,000 remaining in the city hall fund at the end of this fiscal year. Um, this is our estimate for earned interest. This grant number represents an abatement grant that um, I feel very confident in that we will receive from Business Oregon for the asbestos abatement um, on the existing buildings. So, um, you know, now, until you sign the dotted line, it is not guaranteed, but um, the folks I'm working with at Business Oregon um, made me feel confident enough that I can put this into the budget. So I'm projecting we'll get 60,000 for that. And then the general fund transfer is here. Um, so that gives us close to a million dollars in the total city hall construction fund. Uh, those, that estimate uh, includes, so the professional services line item, that's where the architect and the owner's representative contracts will live. This $50,000 is if we need to do any additional due diligence, it's, um, it's there to help with that. And then the capital outlay includes a little bit more than what our current estimate is, but that should be sufficient for the city to do the abatement and the demolition of the structures that are on that site. And then finally, 
the loan repayment for Underhill Plaza um, comes out of here. I should note that we didn't transfer any money from the general funds in here to cover the loan payment last year. So um, just something to think about. I don't know if that was a bad move on my part, but we didn't do that. So the city hall construction fund actually paid for the debt service last fiscal year or this current fiscal year. And that gets us to, again, a balanced budget for that fund, $980,250. Anybody have any questions? Well, I just one kind of follow up on the abatement. Is that the grant that you're looking at for 60000 Yes. Business Oregon. Okay, that's excellent. I've heard rumors that that we're not looking for grants, and I thought I think that's good to know. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I don't know who that's who's telling you that, but I am looking for money under cushions and talking to everybody. In fact, Dan and I have are going to be meeting with the Office of Emergency Management. Um, I should note that I just recently learned we didn't get the appropriation that we applied for. I spent a whole weekend. And so I'm like, uh, we we're applying for grants, um, trying to apply for an appropriation. There were over 50 applications, um, but uh, Congresswoman Bonamici's office has us on their list. And so I know if there are resources that come up, they'll be reaching out. So we are absolutely looking everywhere for money. So you, you have been meeting directly with and talking to Senator Bonamici? Well, not personally her. I met her once, but I've been working with her staff and okay. when they did a call for um, an appropriation um, for applications from local jurisdictions within her district. Uh, we applied for that. Excellent. Thank you. From the Emergency Operations Center. Um, yeah, that's so, disappointing. Yeah. So I am in contact with her office and I am, like I said, Dan and I will be meeting with the Office of Emergency Management to see if there's any resources there. Every penny counts. You know, if we can get a $20,000 grant to pay for some Absolutely. materials or uh, our our uh, emergency management center, then I'm in. Like, no grant is too small. So call me if you have money. <laughs> well, I also heard about one through NOAA for hazardous abatement. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, we should talk about that one because I the 60000 is not going to cover the demolition no. costs. So we need more money there. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely shoot that my way. I would love okay. to. Okay, we'll do. Great. 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 Hey, can you um, repeat um, what the four hundred fifty thousand dollars professional services are? Uh? Sure. Yeah. So we have um, we have a currently we are under contract. We have a development team. <clears throat> so we have an architect, an owner's rep, and a contractor. We have split the project into two phases. Um, so we are now at the end of phase one, which got us to 30% schematic design. Uh, to get to phase through phase two, which gets us through construction documents, uh, that amount covers the cost of our architectural contract. So we can't, the city can't sign a contract unless there's money in the budget that can cover that contract. So it covers that contract. It also covers the city's owner's representative contract for phase two. Um, so there's so the, there's $450,000 doesn't even get us started on the building. No, that construction, um, we're anticipating the GMP, which is the guaranteed maximum price for the construction to be 3.7 million. So that, that's a good point. Um, I didn't account for any debt. I didn't account for any expenditure on a building. If the city council elects to move into phase two, um, it is still their decision to decide how to finance that. So we're actually gonna be having a council meeting on a Wednesday um, to talk through financing options. And then city council is expected to make a decision. Um, they don't have to decide on the financing options, but at some point this fiscal year, if council elects to move into phase two of the project, um, they will have to determine what type of instrument they want to use, whether it's a loan or whether it's a geo bond, 
that will require a supplemental budget. So we'll be back here again to go through a much more simplified version of what we're doing right now to account for that income and then that expenditure. But because we don't have a decision from city council on whether we are going to proceed, I didn't think it was prudent to include any estimates for revenue or expenditures. I'd rather have council be able to make that decision and then come back if needed through a supplemental budget process and make those changes. And what is the $324,000 um, city hall? I mean, um, oh. yeah. 324000 for the city hall construction. What does it mean? Yeah, so there are two buildings that are on the Underhill Plaza site that are um, full of hazardous materials. And so irregardless of whether or not city council decides to move forward with the city hall construction project, um, those buildings, particularly the Quonset Hut, but both buildings need to be abated and demolished um, for public safety and health reasons. And council's that's already made that okay. decision. So that's okay. enough resources for us to do that. So we so are hoping really to get that done as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Those are great questions, thank you. I got one more, if you're up for it. Okay. All right, Tourism Promotion and Facilities Fund. So this is the restricted funds that have to be used for tourism promotion and our facilities. And I think the city has done a really good job finding ways to use those resources to support sort of the livability aspects of uh, the services we provide. And so all the proposals I've made in here today um, have been run by um, the Tillamook County Visitors Association who works with the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association who are the folks that really monitor how this money is spent. So the big change this year is that 0.75 FTE that is the code enforcement position. Um, some folks participated in the destination management planning effort that was led by TCVA, and then also through the town hall work that we did last year Code enforcement has been kind of a top-notch issue for the city for a long time. And in fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, credit uh, former councilor Steve Nuttall, who was involved in the short-term rental committee work group. One of the um, main recommendations from that work group was to have a staff person who could focus on short-term rental visitor um, and visitor, um, you know, relations as well as enforcement. And so last fiscal year, Councillor Nettle added $20,000 to the city's um, professional services line item to hire sort of a temporary part part time person for the summer. Um, and working with Chief Hearth and um, and kind of gathering all of that information that's been um, gathered over the last couple of years um, and working with TCBA um, and Orla, we are proposing that position be primarily covered out of the tourism promotion fund. Um, that person will meet at least quarterly um, with me and with uh, Nan, the executive director of TCBA and our new police sergeant um, on a regular basis. That person will coordinate with our, our uh, contract person who works out of Carolyn, um, who works out of the visitors um, center. So that's, that's the big change. Um, the FTE also includes uh, a certain percentage of, and it's on the page 17 of the budget, um, of public works personnel who was responsible for um, maintaining those facilities. The big change from this is that we actually allocated the full, the full part-time position of the public works department, which is currently vacant. Um, and so when Dan sort of reshifted staff, uh, he sort of divided that responsibility out among all of his staff. So instead of covering the full F, full 0.6 FTE, 
you'll see that that is now distributed across the public works staff, um, which accounts for uh, in total uh, 1.48 FTE. So that's the big shift here. Um, City Council approved a contract with TCVA. So that's what the contract services line item represents. And that includes uh, some additional time for that person to help coordinate the 4th of July parade, um, building maintenance and operations. Um, we reduced stationary and supplies because we don't go through a whole lot of them. So again, just trying to right size the budget. Um, professional services line item. So these are uh, just additional services usually uh, for Josh who does IT for the visitor center that comes out of this line item. Um, council approved as part of that uh, contract, $20,000 in off season grants. So that's included in here as the grant sign item and then materials and supplies. Um, these are just for um, things like, um, we actually included some resources here for things like getting some new Christmas lights um, and other sort of um, items that can be used for um, tourism promotion. So that represents materials and services line item. Um, we reduce the amount of money for the equipment side of things just to reflect kind of what we expect to spend this year. The debt service for the visitor center, as you can see, is in this fund. So it paid out of this fund. We also have uh, just a contingency, just in case. Um, and then the reserve for future is just the unappropriated uh, fund balance after all of that, which gets us to, um, again, a balanced budget of $713,000. Anybody have any questions on that? Well, Layla, are we at the end of today? Today's meeting? You did it. Yeah. And in two yeah. hours. Awesome. You did it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see Brad has a question, though. So let's make sure we get that. Uh, can you uh, speak a little bit? about what's going to go on tomorrow um, for folks that are listening and for those that are, of us sure. that are on here the first time? Yeah. Um, so tomorrow's meeting will be, uh, we'll start with Scott and the building fund and the building reserve fund. Um, and then Dan will have most of the floor tomorrow to talk about the water utility fund, the public works equipment reserve fund, Water SDC Fund, the Storm Drain Fund, the Parks SDC Fund, the Road Fund, and then I'll wrap it up with the Timber Management Fund, the Housing Loan Rehab Fund, and oh, and I didn't mention, sorry, I do want to point this out, the Trust Fund. I'm recommending that we close the Trust Fund and transfer that money into the Tourism Promotion Fund. So I'm sorry, I could show that it's in the budget, um, but I just wanted to make sure that folks at home know that too, that I'm recommending we close that fund, we transfer, it's like 3,900 and some odd dollars. That will go into the tourism promotion fund um, to be used because that's kind of what it's used for anyway. And since the 4th of July parade is now being kind of managed by person who's being paid out of that fund, um, I thought that that would be the the smoothest way. So I'm sorry I didn't mention that when I went through the the resources side of things. So if you have any questions about that, so so we'll wrap up with the timber management fund and the housing loan revolving fund, and then we're done. Yeah, and also if if anybody's got any questions, nag, nag, nagging questions from overnight, to say oh I'm trying to remember something that we talked about today. You can bring those back too. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll just, yeah. So, does anybody have then anything have else for today? Public. Community. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Well, let's let's declare this meeting adjourned, and we'll be back again four o'clock tomorrow.
and uh, ready to hit it and keep moving ahead. I think we made good progress today. Thank you very much for all your uh, participation.